I am going to introduce James, and then James is going to introduce the fantastic panel, and I'm going to go at a sort of volcanic pace so um, we can get everything settled. But my name is Patty, and I manage public programs here at California Historical Society. How many of you have been here before? All right, well, welcome back. I see some members in the crowd and some event attendees. We thank you for coming. And we thank anybody who's new for coming and joining us tonight at our public programs. We actually do 50 or 60 of these a year, both in this location and off-site. So we're a very active programming space, and it allows us to do programming around things like our exhibition, which you see around you right now. It's called Boomtowns, How Photography Shaped Los Angeles and San Francisco. It's 100 years of photography and 150 photographs. So there's a lot of powerful images here. At the end of the program, when you are speaking to the speakers or talking amongst each other, please take a look at the show as well. Um, it's an amazing opportunity tonight to this, this program. Marie, Francis, everyone who helped devise this idea alongside the panelists, I, I cannot be more thankful because when we were thinking about what to do for the 40th, we really wanted to ensure that the context, that the rich history around the movement and around the Bay Area in California was recognized. So when we think about People's Temple, when we think about Jonestown, we think about it within the context of from when it happened, as well as what happened to black communities in the Bay Area and California broadly at that time as well. So I think it was a great opportunity and I'm so honored that James and Russell and Natalie and Yolanda are all here to speak to you tonight. Um, James is, of course, you know, well-lauded professor at USF, obviously very active right now since he writes about politics and talks about politics after the midterm elections, so very busy man. Um, he wrote an amazing book, Black Nationalism in the United States, from Malcolm X to Barack Obama. He's the former president of the National Conference of Black Political Scientists, an important organization for African Americans, Africans, and Afro-Caribbean um, political scientist in the United States from 2009 to 2011. He's currently writing and researching a book with the working title, and James pipe in if it's changed at all, People's Temple, Jim Jones and California Black Politics. The book is a study of People's Temple and the African American political history in the state of California. Taylor earned his PhD at the University of Southern California. I'm gonna hand him the bios now so he can tell everybody else's. Um, but we're really honored again to have Yolanda and Natalie and Russell here. You're really in for a treat. I'm gonna hand it over to James and we're gonna start this amazing program. And of course, you have index cards on your chairs. Those are for you to ask your questions. When you do have one, raise your hand. I'll come grab it and bring it to James, and he'll incorporate it within the conversation. It's more a Commonwealth Club style way of doing questions. That means everyone gets heard, and that everyone's question is included and is important. So um, it's a great way to, to create that interactivity for the panel. So anyway, handing it over to James. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. So thank you. Let's give her a round of applause for getting us all together. Um, and we want to thank uh, Patricia, Marie, and Francis, and the staff here at the California Historical Society for, again, having the, the mindset and the um, commitment to, to doing this, um, to recognizing this very important history um, and this very important um, uh, reality uh, as, a, as a part of the city's history. So I'll go quickly into introducing Russell Rickford. Um, I was lucky enough to have written an article on Malcolm X's wife, Betty Shabazz, and the main source I used was about a 500-page book that he wrote <laughs> uh, on Betty Shabazz, and I learned so much about her through him. And so I, I was just taken by him as a scholar, like, well, who is this brother? And at the time, we both had these afros, you know, the whole Lenny Kravitz look. But I don't think Lenny Kravitz has a Lenny Kravitz look anymore. <laughs> and obviously we don't. Uh, so we lost our hair uh, about the same time. But uh, Russell uh, has roots here in the Bay Area. His father, where, where's, where's dad at? His, his, his parents are right here in the front. His um, mom and dad, he'll talk more about them. Um, but uh, he's an associate professor of history at Cornell University. He specializes in African-American political culture and World War II, the black radical tradition, and transnational social movements. His current book, We Are an African People, Independent Education, Black Power, and the Radical Imagination, received the Liberty Legacy Award from the Organization of American Histor Historians. He is currently working on a book about Guyana and African American radical politics in the 1970s. Rickford's scholarship, I'm sorry, Rickford's scholarly articles have appeared in Journal of American History, Journal of Amer African American History, Souls, New Labor Review, and other publications. His popular writing has appeared 
Nice. She's like, okay, uh, let me get you the 40 year old plus version. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. He is currently working on a book, uh, as we said. Uh, he is also writes a radical and so, uh, on radical racial and social justice for the African American Intellectual History Society's Black per Perspectives blog um, and other sites. Rickford holds a bachelor's from Howard and a doctorate from Columbia University, a native of Guyana. He lives in Ithaca, New York, and he's based here. And his parents are from the Bay Area, and he was raised in the Palo Alto community where his father teaches as a professor. So let's welcome Russell Rickford. Yolanda Williams is well known here throughout the city, uh, especially in the Fillmore community, but as a law enforcement officer throughout the, uh, the region. As a native San Franciscan, she graduated with a scholarship at, uh, to attend UC Berkeley from Lowell High School. Uh, uh, Lieutenant, I don't like to call her by her first name. Lieutenant Williams received her inspiration, uh, passion, and desire to help her community from her father, the late Reverend Harry W. Williams, and she'll talk more about him. Uh, Lieutenant Williams and members of her immediate family are the only documented People's Temple members to be voluntarily released by Jim Jones from Jonestown. Her survival skills, instinct, and resiliency lead her to her, led her to her distinguished career in law enforcement with the San Francisco Police Department. She has over 28 years of distinguished service with the SFPD and is ranked lieutenant. She's the first black female employed by SFPD um, to be certified with the credentials of master instructor and the first black female as, uh, to serve as member of the board of directors of the San Francisco Police Officers Association. She's also the president of the Officers for Justice Youth Program. She's, published author, she's a published author with a featured cover story in Correctional Technology, CTM Magazine, called Youth Courts, New Methods to Deal with Juvenile uh, Delinquents. And uh, she also has a book that, that, that she's uh, working on her, in her own right uh, as, related, as it relates to her experience in People's Temple and in Jonestown. Um, I just love her so much. Um, I, I loved her before I ever met her for years. I would see her on clips, YouTube clips studying the movement, and I would see her talking. And I'm just like, I've got to meet Yolanda Williams. And it took me years, about eight years to meet her. And then one day, actually I met her one day at Evergreen. She was talking to Grace and uh, Grace, Ms. Grace Stone was here, and she was talking to uh, Laura Johnson Cole and to Le Leslie. And it was a little bit of a, you remember that. And, um, and that was the first time I've met her, but I didn't see her again for eight years. And then I was asked by SFPD to do some voluntary work um, related to debates in, Oakland, in San Francisco about the taser use here in San Francisco. So as a part of that committee work, I'm going into S L SFPD one day and I'm completely lost, don't know where I am, so I just walk around to any open office and say, excuse me, I'm here for this meeting, uh, and I saw her. And I said, the first thing I said to her, I said, ooh, you were with People's Temple, weren't you? <laughs> and I didn't mean it in a negative way, I meant like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm here with you. Like, we need, we, 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 are lo we have a long overdue meeting. And then as soon as she saw me, and as soon as I said that to her, she just took me under her arms, took me in the office, and just sat me down for two hours and talked to me after eight years of trying to catch up with her. That was my first meeting, with, uh, my first real meeting with, um, with Lieutenant Williams. Um, so Dr. Natalie Hopkinson is a fellow of the Interacti Interactivity Foundation as an assistant professor of Howard uh, University's doctoral program in communication, culture, and media studies, and a columnist for the Huffington Post, where I've seen you a lot on Huffington Post. She's the author, uh, most recently, of a, of a book called A Mouth is Always Muzzled, Six Dissidents, Five Continents, and the Art of Resistance. Came out February 2018 in New Press, a book set in her parents' native Guyana that was cited as a top human rights book by the Hong Kong Free Press. The Independent Publishers Association's awarded Muzzled the 2018 Spirit Award for demonstrating the courage and creativity necessary to take chances, break new ground, and bring about change, not only to the world of publishing, but to our society. A former staff writer, editor, and media culture critic at the Washington Post and The Root, she earned her PhD at the University of Maryland College Park. Welcome, Dr. Hopkinson. Thank you. Let's give them all a round of, of, of welcome. So uh, we have a, a set of questions we wanted to start off with. And um, again, you will have uh, ample time to submit questions and ask, um, and you can direct them to the whole group or to any individual if you want. But I wanted to at least start us off and give each person a sort of opportunity to tell you how they approach this, this question and the, and the issues of, of Jonestown and People's Temple. So I, I've asked, I'll ask the question to, the, to all of you um, in whatever order you want to respond. Could you each explain your interest in or relationship to People's Temple Movement and Jonestown? 
Could you each explain your interest in or relationship to the People's Temple Movement in Jonestown? Dr. Parkinson? <laughs> so I can answer uh, first because okay, mine Dr. will be Parkinson. short. Um, so being with my parents, I was born in Canada. My parents are both from Guyana. And whenever you say you're from Guyana, that's the first thing people say is, oh, Jonestown. Uh, but my parents actually left in 1970, so they were gone by the time this happened. But this is something that has become larger than Guyana, you know, and I, I think in, I guess, the public imagination. And so um, that's my main connection to it. Uh, with the last book, I was able to learn a lot more about Guyana and its cultural history um, since independence. And that's how, I think that's how I can, it kind of can maybe explain a little bit how that became the setting for this, um, you know, horrible tragedy uh, that happened, so. Um, well, first of all, it's a, it's a pleasure and honor. Do I have to press anything or is it right rocking? Okay. Well, it's a pleasure and honor to, to, to be here. Um, and to be on such an august, uh, uh, you know, panel um, to talk about this um, tremendously important event. I think an event that is a profoundly a San Francisco event and a San Francisco story um, in so many ways. Um, as was mentioned, my, my folks are right here in the Bay Area. I'm on the other side of the world in, uh, in upstate New York. Um, but, but both of my parents are still here in the, in the Bay Area. They're both uh, Guyanese. Um, James mentioned uh, my dad, John Rickford, and my mother, Angela Rickford, um, is also a, an, an academic um, uh, and an education professor at San Jose State. Um, so my, uh, my connection to um, Jonestown, well, there are a number of different connections. Um, I myself was born uh, in Guyana, uh, in Georgetown. I have an intellectual uh, and a political interest in uh, Guyana. I'm working on a uh, a book about um, the connections between African American radical politics and Guyana in the 1970s. Um, so it's in that context that I uh, come to um, to Jonestown. But in a sort of larger sense, I study the black radical tradition, and I study various forms of black internationalism, uh, particularly in the 1970s. Um, and so because I have um, spent so much of my um, time dealing with the question of how African Americans envision freedom beyond the boundaries of the United States in this moment. Um, when I came to the question of, of Jonestown, a number of the sort of political connections um, that I saw uh, in terms of what would drive um, not only Americans, but in particular African Americans, um, to be attracted to this relatively obscure third world nation um, that would be attracted to this place that was in the midst of a, of a pan-Africanist experiment, a socialist experiment, a, a third worldist or non-aligned, you know, orientation. Um, it seemed to me um, very coherent. Um, it seemed to me um, quite logical in the context of the, the radical politics that I um, study. And so I think part of my goal, both sort of intellectually and politically, in studying um, Jonestown is to help to contextualize and historicize um, the movement, at least the sort of political elements of it that are connected to the larger you know, sense of black uh, internationalism and engagement with the radical third world that I study. Thank you. Thank you. Lieutenant Williams? Well, I, I, I'm honored again to be here in your presence. Um, if I think back 40 years ago, I never would have thought I would have seen the United States again. I can't say that there was uh, an interest initially in People's Temple, but I can say to you what made me continue to go and what lured my family into People's Temple was the fact that, first of all, my father had sustained a heart uh, condition that was not going to allow him to work any longer. And one of his clergy friends had told him of Jim Jones and the fact that he was a prophet that was able to heal people. So that is originally what lured us to People's Temple. But then, of course, I have to recognize that there was 
some type of attraction that kept us there. And the attraction was the fact that as black Americans, we had lost our leader who was Martin Luther King. And we were in search for a leader, someone who would advocate for social justice and ensuring that we were going to be considered an important aspect in society. And at the time when I joined People's Temple in Redwood Valley, when I was at the tender age of 11, it was based upon the fact that I saw something that did not exist in the black churches, which was a rainbow coalition, young, old, educated, uneducated, rich and poor, all in one congregation. And then I saw people, young people, some who were my age, that were recovering from drugs. I saw a man who spoke about the importance of education and having respect for your fellow man. And it was basically those things that lured me and made me continue to want to be a part of People's Temple. So it really, for me, was a movement. And I felt that I had a responsibility, and they gave me a sense of importance and being at the time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hopkinson, I wanted to sort of come with you with the next question. Um, and that is to sort of get at, um, how, how would you describe your understanding of the movement and its ag agricultural project in Guyana? How do you interpret or think about the program, uh, the possibilities uh, af uh, of, the po I'm sorry, uh, think about its program and possibilities to affect wider change. I don't know why I was troubling with that, but uh, to, uh, its possibilities to affect wider change. Yeah, so, um you know, as I mentioned before, uh, usually when you hear about Jonestown, you hear about it being in the jungle in Guyana, and um, there was actually a whole country, and, um, but to be fair, it's 80% covered in rainforest, Guyana is, <laughs> so it is mostly uh, jungle. Um, but the country, it was a British colony and had just had uh, recently um, gotten independence uh, from Great Britain in 66, and there, as early as the, the 50s, um, there was really a lot of communist and socialist movements. There was a lot of people, like the Marxist ideas had really started to take hold there. And so it was really like a lot of utopian, really d people did really think about it as a place that could start a new beginning and create a new society that would be more equitable than the one before. Um, but because of the, you know, the red baiting and, um, that was going on in, in the country at the time, Guyana became very isolated. Um, and so by the 70s, um, they, the, the government had socialized the sugar industry, they started socializing the bauxite industry, and as a result of that, the Americans had slashed aid. Um, so to give it to some perspective, in, in 1968, uh, the United States was, I think the figure was 18 million um, that they had been giving an aid to Guyana, which is you know a small country under a million people. Uh, by 74, that figure went down to 200,000. Mm. Um, sugar prices had dropped through the floor. Um, and so there really wasn't, you know, China and, and Russia, which are places that had supported um, move these kind of movements in, in places like Guyana, they were sort of busy, you know, thinking about <laughs> other places. So, um, you know, Guyana was really looking for anywhere to get support. So, um, so they were really would be open, you know, to some charismatic American uh, with a flock of people to coming in um, to be able to set up. Uh, something sort of an equitable society, you know, it's very much in line with a lot of the political thinking locally at the time. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to address that question? Um, how do you describe or understand the movement and its agricultural project in Guyana? Very briefly, I, I would just also add, uh, I mean, Natalie covered a lot of it in terms of the politics of, of Guyana, but Guyana was, oh, I'm sorry. Guyana was also uh, in a long-standing territorial dispute with Venezuela, um, and so much of that land, is, you know, which is it's it, it's, it's really um, the bush, it's 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 jungle, it's rainforest. Um, the 
was contested. Um, and so, you know, uh, Jim Jones's um, project was attractive, I think, to the Burnham ad administration, to um, Forbes Burnham, um, for a number of reasons, part of which it was going to help him to assert, um, you know, sort of control over this, this vast um, uh, hinterland. Um, also, I mean, the, the, as part of the, the government's shift to, um, to, you know, it called itself a cooperative socialist republic, there was this real emphasis on, on agriculture and on agricultural production. Right? And the idea was that, you know, that Guyana as this you know, new post-colonial nation was in the midst of this um, attempt to uh, basically transcend you know, Western capitalism um, and to become self-sufficient. You know? um, and, and so there was this tremendous focus on productivity. And you hit this infusion, uh, frankly, of people, people who were willing to be tremendously disciplined and to work hard. Um, and to produce, and so that, that was very attractive, I think, to President Burnham. Thank you. I think what also attracted People's Temple to the Guyanese government was the fact that, first of all, Jim Jones spoke very highly of Marxism, socialism, and, of course, the members of People's Temple, we were extremely disciplined people. And prior to the migration of most of the members in 77. We had members over there in late 75 and 76. Those members began to till the soil and they began to build. And of course, the Guyanese government saw that these people were willing to embark on this mission and land that they knew was basically worthless because you couldn't grow any real crops there. It was agonizing, gruelingly painful to have to do what was necessary in order to create some type of living environment. And um, ultimately, the attraction was also that all of these people represented U.S. dollars. And at that time, one dollar was worth a lot to a Guyanese citizen. And, and oh, still is? okay, great, okay, all right. But the the other thing is that we were people who were educated as well as being disciplined. And Jim Jones always had a way that charismatic attitude, which would attract those who were interested in power and control. And Forbes Berman was about power and control. So they had far more in common than they did not. Mm. And I think this is another reason why it was an attractive embarkment for both individuals. Thank you. Thank you. So after 60 books, uh, after all the books, about 60 I've counted, documentaries, stage productions, archival research and curation with California Historical Society and the Jonestown Institute, survivor accounts, differences among survivors expressed over the Evergreen Memorial. What remains vital or important for people to understand about the People's Temples Movement and Jonestown Agricultural Project? What remains vital or important for us to understand about both phases of the movement related to its life or end? related to its life or end? I think the most important thing for those of us who are here in the United States to remember is that everyone that was a member of People's Temple could have been any one of you. They were United States citizens. We deserved better. Those of us who came back here as survivors deserved better treatment than we got upon arrival. We were thought of being atheists, and not everyone was atheists, first of all. We, had, we were labeled to the point that we did not feel comfortable in our own country. And that was an atrocity within itself. Many of us went into hiding for years. We were afraid to interconnect with each other. We were afraid beyond human imagination. 
we were traumatized. We came back from Jonestown traumatized. And then when we came here to the United States, we basically were treated just like the Vietnam vets. And that's a horrible feeling to not feel that you're accepted anywhere. Fortunately for me, I had family members that were there to give me the resiliency and the protective factors that I needed to be able to sustain myself and my life. But there were many survivors who did not fare, it didn't fare out that well for them. I have one friend whose son has spent most of his life in prison. And it's sad to hear that. Some of the young children that came back got involved in drugs, crimes, and other things. And that was never what was meant to be, and that was never the legacy that any of the members of People's Temple wanted to uh, have go down in history. Dr. Hopkinson or, or Rick Fred, is there anything, uh, you know, sort of, is there anything left or what remains vital? or important um, uh, to follow up? Well, you know, I, I guess if I would add, um, uh, or I, and perhaps I might ask Lieutenant Williams to- Microphone. Um, oh, <laughs> oh, right here. Can y'all hear me? <laughs> Not really, oh, they're recording, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm, I won't buck the program, Patty, I'm there, okay. Um, Certainly, so, okay, you know, when we think about the 1970s more broadly, right, I think that there are many, um, there are many movements, um, or there, there are many collective experiences um, in American history at that time that sort of reflect a larger sense of alienation, um, of malaise, of, of being disjointed, of searching for, uh, for meaning, um, and, and certainly, um, I, I'm, I'm deeply sympathetic to the experience of returning and feeling um, both misunderstood um, and in many ways uh, caricatured. Um, um, but I would also say that, you know, as someone who studies um, radical politics and tries to understand the logic of, of radicalism more broadly, there is also, I think, mean, part of the pull to um, Guyana um, reflected the alienation that, that not just um, the, the, the Jonestown pilgrims felt, but that many Americans felt. Alienation from their own society, right? Alienation from a society, you know, the most powerful country in the world that was waging an, an awful war on one of the poorest countries, uh, you know, in the world, in, in, in Vietnam, um, that seemed to have turned its back um, on, uh, in many ways, on whatever commitment to racial justice had come out of the um, 1960s in the wake of all of these uh, assassinations, in the wake of all of this turmoil, um, in the midst of um, austerity and the, the shredding of the social safety net and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, and at least, I, I don't, I don't, and I'll, I'll, I'll put out this provocative formulation, and I, and I don't know what Natalie or, or Lieutenant Williams would, how they would respond to it, but when I think about that larger social context, that political context, it almost seems to me that you could make the radical critique that, um, that these weren't Americans fleeing to the jungle, but these were Americans fleeing the jungle. Wow. Oof. I would Hold on, let me, let's absorb that. <laughs> wow, go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> I would con concur with you that, first of all, we had so many choices. You could have joined the Nation of Islam. You had Angela Davis. You had Malcolm X. You had Martin Luther King. You had Mahatma Gandhi. There was so many different type of movements and organizations you could have become involved in. But again, what attracted many people to People's Temple was the thought of a new utopia, the opportunity to have a rainbow coalition of all these different diverse types of people. Gentrification was going on. It was just starting off, and we were starting to feel that there was really a disconnect between the poor class, 
the middle class and the upper class, because if you recall, during that time there were clearly three classes. And of course, now I think it's only two. And I think I'm still in the lower class. I'm trying to figure this out. I work and I'm still in the lower class. But again, there were all of these pressures and, and that you were experiencing. And if you had any level of consciousness, you were going to pick some side. And it's just unfortunate that 917 of us were actually lured in the wrong direction. But we certainly did not decide one day, we want to all go live in a jungle. It did not happen like that. We were seeking a better life that was free from government intervention. We were seeking a life where we didn't have to have police or laws or anything like that to govern one another. So we were trying to create our own new world order, if we want to consider it that way. That's what was really going on. And it took us, unfortunately, to the jungle of Guyana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to add, I mean, it just, it, it's a very seductive idea. Yes. And it's very, I mean, and I think because we know the end and we know how it ended, um, it's easy to lose track of that impulse to really just create something brand new. Um, and, you know, this just happened to be the setting. I mean, I, before we uh, got on here, I, you know, and just reading about Jim Jones, you know, coming from Indiana and being an anti-racist. I mean, I lived in Indiana in the 80s. <laughs> and um, I can't even imagine, I can't even imagine a white anti-racist uh, coming out of Indiana uh, from the 1950s, you know, and, um, you know, and then there's also, you know, he's bringing his white privilege with him too, and that's also, you know, impacting the way people are responding to him, including the government too. So, I mean, there aren't too many white people coming back to Guyana at that point. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I mean, I could see, it's like, it's a beautiful dream that just sort of went awry. And, you know, I think that that, you know, I appreciate hearing your perspective being somebody you, who was on the inside. Let me interrupt you. Could, yeah. you. could you say that in a, in a room full of only Guyanese people that it was a beautiful dream going awry to a bunch of Guyanese? What, what would their reaction be? Would it be acceptance or skepticism? Does that make sense? Am I, is my question making sense? <laughs> well, I'm not actually Guyanese, so I don't no, know. No, I'm just wondering. I'm wondering if, I'm wondering, in here. other words, if, 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 if you put the, the positive, you know, angle on it, I'm wondering if the Guyanese, a room full of Guyanese people would sort of say, yeah, we agree or we don't agree that, that this was a... I mean, so Guyana is very complicated. It's very racially divided. Right. You know, the country right. is majority, uh, a population of East Indian descended from indentured workers um, brought to Guyana to work sugar. Um, and then the second largest group is the African, uh, Afro-Guyanese, Afro and um, they actually had gotten political power at that point, not through legitimate means, right? So uh, most, if you talk to your average Gu Guyanese, they're just gonna say bad things right, about right, Burnham. Right, right. <laughs> well, actually, depending on their race often, they'll say bad things about Burnham. If they're Afro-Guyanese, a lot of people uh, consider him a brilliant man, who also maybe had made some mistakes, but had a good uh, had a good idea, mm -hmm. and wasn't going to be pushed over mm -hmm. by these imperialists, the capitalists, and you know just somebody who was sort of a rebel and taking a stand against injustice. Mm -hmm. um, now Jim Jones, I mean I don't know that you're going to hear that much, um, but I'm just saying for me somebody who's Discon I mean, I was born in 1976. Right. I'm completely disconnected right. from him. Right. I can just looking at the sweep of his life and understanding how racist this country is. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I, I could see how people would be very um, attracted and, and could kind of uh, want to believe in this vision. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, can I, can go ahead. A, a quick question. Actually, I, I, James, I'd love Microphone. I'd love to, I'd love to, with your permission, I'd love to, to ask sure, Lieutenant sure. Williams something. Sure. You know, I, I mean, I think the truth, from, from my sense is, I don't know, my, my, my folks could probably answer this better than me, my, my sense is that most Guyanese, and it's true that Guyanese are deeply divided along ethnic and, and racial lines, but this is something that actually might unify many of them. And my sense is that, I could be wrong, that they would suck their teeth, which is to say that I think that there's, 
um, I think that there is a, a level of, um, I don't know if disdain is too strong a word, um, that they feel unjustly linked mm -hmm. to something they believe is an American, and you'll forgive me, mess. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that this unfairly tarnished not only Guyana, but the entire Caribbean. Um, and, and, and actually, interestingly, I think there's a corollary to that kind of, again, contempt might be too strong a word, among many black Americans, not all black Americans, but many black Americans, at least in reading some of the responses from the black press and from um, black figures at the time, there was almost this sense that these folks, and by, by, by folks we mean the black majority, went to the other side of the world behind this white man. Yeah. Yeah. Right? What would, so there's almost this way in which they were trying to sort of posthumously um, put folks out of the family. In other words, they, they lacked a kind of a black savvy that they were taken in, again, that it, it, it reflects the larger narrative that these were dupes, that these were simply victims, that they weren't, they weren't agents, savvy, no right? They weren't agents, right? So I wonder if you would, if, if you experienced that and if you would respond to that. Uh, in fact, you hit the nail right on the head. I was going to get to that at some point. But certainly, we were characterized primarily by black religious leaders and officials that we got what we deserved because we turned our backs on God. We decided to follow this white man to a foreign country. And they felt like the United States did not and have to do an intervention because we elected to do this on our own. So that is another layer of it. I've spoken with some people who are my age that are Guyanese citizens that are actually here in the United States. And when they found out who I was, they were like, oh my God, you were over there? And I said, why does it shock you? Again, they had preconceived notions as to what a survivor from Jonestown would be doing or would look like. And again, they have stated that we hurt their country. We brought severe harm and damage to them that they will never be able to sustain or become a tourist attraction other than for someone that wants to see what Jonestown looks like or someone who wants to say, oh yeah, let me go see what these folks look like that are over there, these little Guyanese people. So we've hurt, I would say, a large portion of South America. Because mm. I'm going to tell you personally, after I've had that one experience in 77 of going over to South America, I don't have any interest in touring South America. <laughs> I'm sorry. Be because I'm afraid. Uh, you, you know, uh, I remember the sign that always hung in the pavilion. Those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. I don't want to repeat it. So I'm going to make sure I don't repeat it because I'm not going over there. <laughs> I'll find someplace else to go on vacation. So again, I have to agree with you, um, Russell, that uh, we have done more damage and harm to that small country. And we would never be able to repay them back. And we've had some survivors that have gone back over there. I had mixed feelings about whether or not I wanted to see it or not. But I also still have guilt and remorse for what harm we brought to that small country of Guyana. They did not deserve that. Mm. Thank you. Um, and this is really a follow-up to you. Um, after 40 years, uh, uh, the bottom line is, has the media done a better job um, in terms of how it reports about or, or covers Jonestown and People's Temple? So has there been an evolution or at least a serious scholarly and some journalistic effort, including Oprah Winfrey and other media, to approach an understanding of People's Temple and Jonestown uh, Agricultural Project that is today different 
than in 78 through, say, 80 or so. Has the media done a better job more in the last 40 years than it did in the first, say, five to 10? <laughs> I hate to get on the media like this. However, the common thread that seems to always interest the media is the sexual exploits of Jim Jones. And then, of course, the final day and the Kool-Aid. And they make the Kool-Aid jokes and all this other stuff. They fail to realize that these were human beings, individuals, and there are many of their family members and friends who still survive today. And the one thing that the media has failed to do is to portray the story of the black Americans, who most of the members in People's Temple were black and brown people. However, we have never been allowed to tell our story and to share our truths in the major media channels. We have not been portrayed in many of the uh, footages that are shown. I mean, so again, it marginalizes our existence. However, we lost big in 78. We have not recovered from that. And that is truly what I feel to this day. The drugs were out on the scene. And remember, the 900 folks that were over there, primarily black, left their family members over here in the United States to deal with the fact that they were not going to see their loved ones anymore. Many of them turned to drugs. Many of them got involved in other things. So again, the impact is still hitting generation after generation after generation. I found the young lady I was expressing to you that is now in the San Francisco Police Department. Her grandmother carried her mother on her back while the, while the, I shouldn't say suicide, how could I even put that in my mouth? The massacre was occurring. And she is now a police officer. And I look at her each day and I feel sorry for her because I know that she still has some of that trauma that's running through her bloodstream just because that is part of her family history. Yeah. And, and on the other end of that equation that she alluded to earlier about a friend, a young man who's been in prison most of his life, um, he was actually the youngest, the youngest person carried out on the day of the killings that morning um, with his mom. And this person has, has been in prison for most of his life, well, his adult life, and is in, life, in prison for the rest of his life on the other side. So one person ends up becoming law enforcement, the other person ends up on the other side of it. And, and this impact, impacted people in all kinds of ways. But I don't think the society ever gave the survivors an opportunity to really express what they were doing and how this went wrong on them too. How they were also disappointed. Everybody thinks that this was some sort of a collective agreement. The literature I read is saying something very different about the consensus around the votes to make a decision one way or the other. Here in September of 1978, a room full of people, if the scholarship is right, Mary Maga's book documents how in September they asked a group of blacks in Ukiah and the room full of blacks with two whites said no in September of 78. Then they took a second vote in September of 78 with three whites in the room and the room said no, except the three whites. To, to the suicide agreement. Um, this is in Mary Maga's book, um, and she has a very sympathetic uh, viewpoint of Jonestown and People's Temple and is very supportive of the Jonestown Institute, so her, she's not being negative and critical at all, um, but she documents this, uh, this dynamic. Um, uh, so, uh, Dr. Hopkinson's, I wanted to, uh, Hopkinson, I wanted to ask you a question related to media, uh, since you're in, in the general area of communications and media. Can you talk about Jonestown from the standpoint of the role you think national, Caribbean, um, and Guyana media in, uh, impacted thinking about the Jonestown Agricultural Project and its destruction 
or more broadly in popular culture. So how are we think how are, how has the media projected um, whether U.S. national media, Guyana, Guyana media, uh, Caribbean media more broadly, um, uh, how have they informed the whole question of the destruction or, or, uh, of Jonestown and, and in pop culture? If that's a coherent question. <laughs> it is a coherent question, and I actually think uh, Dr. Rickford knows a little bit more about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pass the mic. Right? <laughs> uh, that's okay. Um, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that, but since I'm on the mic, uh, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me just shift gears slightly to say that um, I think it's really important, particularly given the current political climate, that we think very carefully about context and we think carefully about that we consider political traditions, because part of my, again, my political and intellectual interest um, in Jonestown is to make this episode legible, is to argue that this was not an aberration, um, that these people were not just crazy and they were not just dupes. There's no question that there was tremendous manipulation and exploitation, and as you point out, that has been thoroughly documented and it should continue to be documented and discussed and 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 i'll be honest you know i'm i'm a secularist i don't really get into the um religious ideas as such although those can't be separated from the politics either but my my real um concern is the political questions and there are multiple traditions of black thought and black politics um that took African Americans um, not only to Guyana, not only African Americans beyond um, People's Temple, there were already African Americans in Guyana. Not many, but there were. And in fact, there were, there were African Americans farming in the Guyanese jungle, you know, not too far from, from Jonestown. Um, so that, you know, the promise of agrarianism, the promise of third worldism, you know, black folks, you know, black folks have been working the land in this country for a very long time, right? And you know what? We always, you know, we always believed um, in our heart of hearts that we would get a piece of this land, that we worked for generations without any compensation. And in fact, we were promised it. And it never happened, you know, for the vast majority of us. So, you know, over the course of the 20th century, we went from being a rural people to being an urban people. But we never fully surrendered that dream and what, what I call the land question, right? Um, that desire for a piece of land where we could be self-sufficient, where we could reconstitute our, our communities, that, that we could survive in peace beyond the, the reach of white supremacy, um, where we could practice a kind of um, collective uh, economics, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, I mean, I think that all of that is part of it. The, the, the anti-imperialist impulse, the anti-colonial impulse, the anti-capitalist impulse, right? Whether you want to talk about scientific socialism and sort of connections to, to Moscow, Western socialism, whether you want to talk about utopian socialism or third world socialism, Maoism, I think all of these, um, you know, People's Temple to me lies at the intersection um, of so many different strands of, of politics and radical politics. And so I don't think that we can see, um, uh, you know, people simple, either, you know, the individuals that were involved or sort of collectively as victims, nor do I think we should see Guyana as a victim, right? I mean, you know, the, the, I don't think that people's, I don't think that Jonestown was about, um, you know, uh, taking pity on a poor and underdeveloped country was part of the promise of the third world, part of the promise of anti-colonialism and post-colonialism, part of the promise of building, as Lieutenant Williams said, a new order beyond the, the, the materialism. From, from what you know about, Joan, for about People's Temple, the movement, the organization, do you think it had the capacity and the wherewithal to, to, to carry? I mean, in other words, if, if November 18th does not happen, 78, what do you think 
in terms of its resources, was possible there. Let's, let's in, a, in a, some you know, magical way, go to September, I mean, November 19th, 1978, and beyond to, to this day. As, as, let's, for a moment, put the horror aside, if, if that's even possible. Was it sustainable as an organization to do the kind of glow, um, work it wanted to do in terms of really not just being a little uh, agricultural project, but becoming an alternative way of being in the world, a society? I think that with November 18th could be erased, there was ultimate possibilities because there was more than enough financial resources there and there were people there who were willing to put in the work necessary without being forced to do it. Mm -hmm. So yes, could, they, could we have built a society that we ultimately were seeking, where we all had our acres of land, our own homes, everything else, what would be considered the promised land, because that's the way it was sold to us, as the promised land. Yes, we could have done it. However, there was just one bad seed, mm. and that was Jim Jones, who, in his ambition to be the ultimate controller, and in his obsession for power, became overcome with his drug usage. And his drug usage is what brought this whole mm -hmm. missionary mm -hmm. project to an end mm -hmm. and to total destruction. Mm -hmm. yeah. If I could just add, um, you know, one of the things that I, one of the conclusions that I sort of came in looking at Guyana um, and its history is, you know, as I mentioned, it is 80% covered in rainforest. Um, uh, Walter Rodney, who's a historian, he talked about how uh, the Africans who were brought there by the Dutch initially uh, cleared uh, a million tons of land by hand uh, just to sort of clear the land to be able to um, to establish cotton and then sugar crops. Um, but wow. it is, a, but it's, but it's also a place that has a large indigenous population, and and actually in getting ready to come here, I spoke with uh, Brackett Williams, who's an anthropologist and uh, who's done some work there in uh, Guyana, and she talked about that uh, she had come across a story in her field work about a mass suicide among the indigenous people, like somewhere fairly close to that area as well. So um, it's a place, I mean, it's pretty tough going. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, one theory I have <laughs> about Guyana, you know, the idea of clearing the rainforest to grow sugar, I, I don't know if that's the best idea. Um, and, you know, it, it's somewhere that's uh, rich in nature. You know, it's somewhere that's very, you know, the, the flora and the fauna are very rich. I don't necessarily think that all places need to be these, uh, you know, economic powerhouses. I mean, some places should be allowed to be um, at, with nature. And, and actually, the indigenous population in Guyana is the, the only population that's really growing mm -hmm. there. Um, and I think that that's almost... Um, I think it's appropriate mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, again, so I don't know. I mean, I don't know that the climate, I don't know that the, um, you know, of course the, the land mass is about the size of Great Britain. So there's a lot of land there, but I don't know that it's, um, you know, it, it had the sort of economic potential that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as, as Russell mentioned, where they were trying to make it go is having a sustainable, sort of an early experiment in sustainability. Yeah. So they wanted to be able to, to have a completely independent uh, society that did not need a lot of imports. You know, you grow everything that you need, you know, and so there was actually a, a Burnham had created a ban on imports, you know, so you weren't allowed to import flour or apples. And that was all part of this idea that it's just going to be us in the land. And, um, and I don't know that that was... Uh, scalable or sustainable. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but again, mm -hmm. you know, beautiful utopian uh, idea in theory. Wait, can, mm -hmm. can I just add real quick, just I know, and I know we need, no, to, get the, we need to get the, the, the audience involved, but you know, uh, when the enslaved people in Guyana seize their freedom, like enslaved people in, in other parts of the, of the so-called new world, they refuse to 
be put back to labor in the way they had been worked under slavery, right? So what they wanted, which is the same thing that freed people wanted in North America and elsewhere, they wanted self-sufficiency, right? They wanted, so they refused to, to raise staple crops. They didn't want to raise, um, you know, rice, um, uh, staple crops. They wanted to raise food to strengthen their families and to, and to engage in a kind of nation building. And mm -hmm. I think that was very much part of the vision of post-colonialism in the 1960s and 1970s. I think that was part of the draw for African Americans in particular um, to places like Guyana. I mean, so, so on one hand, there, there's no question there are deep elements of utopianism, utopian socialism um, in, in the sort of people's temple theology and their political philosophy. But there's also the very concrete radical politics of third worldism. Mm -hmm. The truth is that the Reynolds Company controlled Guyanese economics. Um, uh, the Booker Company controlled Guyanese economics, controlled the bauxite, controlled the natural resources. Yes, you had flag independence, you had your own constitution, but there wasn't true sovereignty, it wasn't true self-government or economic control. So the former colonial world was still, ex you know, neo-colonialism, right? And so this was a, an attempt to escape, you know, the clutches of Western economic domination, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so there's a utopian element, but there's also a radical political mm -hmm. element. Thank you. Time is of the essence, so I want to get these questions in as soon as I can. But this is one I've really been hoping to hear uh, Lieutenant Williams answer. Um, it's a follow-up question. Uh, it says, what if you had a magic wand and could reset events to November 17th, 1978? Do you think people did not understand about People's Temple's movement in Jonestown Agricultural Project on that, from that day backwards? And then after November 18th, 1978. No, wait a minute. So before, before the horrible day and after, what did people not understand about it before the horrible day? And what did people not understand about it after the horrible day? Well, I think that by far and large, people underestimated what, to what extent Jim Jones would go to protect himself and to have his way because he was so accustomed to being able to control everything. He controlled local politics here in San Francisco. George Moscone was in his back pocket and every other politician in San Francisco. Let's be real and truthful about that. So that's the first thing we have to agree upon. And then in looking at that, it was obviously seamlessly for him to feel that he could do that same thing in any other country or location that he decided to embark upon. Now, what people did not understand, they did not understand the power and they did not understand the fact that he had the financial resources in multiple different accounts, in multiple countries, no one understood all of that. So again, if we want to accept the responsibility, we have to not only look at the local government here in San Francisco, but we would have to look at the Internal Revenue Service, we would have to look at um, the United States Passport, Company. In fact, you saw a picture of my passport that flashed up there. It said that I was going to be in South America for two weeks. Well, I don't know how almost four months equates to two weeks, but that's what my passport says. It says a two-week visit. So how is it that it didn't trigger something somewhere as to where is this young woman, it's been far beyond two weeks, okay? But this is just one example of it. But again, it was because everybody wanted to believe that People's Temple was a agricultural missionary project. These were a group of Christian committed people that wanted to do the right thing. And remember, the membership by far and large believed that that was what we were embarking upon. It wasn't until we physically landed there in 
Guyana that we suddenly started to realize that when we were talking about comrades and thinking we were being cool over here in the United States, he was serious about us being comrades in Guyana. We never realized that socialism, what it really looked like until you go to a third world country such as Guyana. And then all of a sudden, I found myself saying, if this is what socialism is about, let me get back to capitalist United States. I'm a capitalist today and I'm proud, you know? I mean, so I think if we look in those terms, we have to hold ourselves accountable for what happened as well, because we were all duped. So I have a quick question for you that comes from the floor. And uh, if you have other questions, you have to su submit them to us. Um, what was it that led Lieutenant Williams' family to request to leave from Jonestown? Well, first of all, when we landed in the Guyanese airport, I knew that we only had three suitcases. I was on heightened alert when suddenly I realized that we had these large wooden crates and I made a spontaneous statement that, that's not my stuff, I don't know whose stuff that is. And I was told, shh, shh, be quiet. When we got to the Capitol and Lamaha Gardens, the, the, the actual um, home that People's Temple used for their main um, business with the Guyanese um, administration. <laughs> I, I guess I'll say it that way. <laughs> um, I realized that we were plotting with some of the white females. There, there was a plot being made for us to have these white females start dating Guyanese officials in order to ensure that we would have black male in control over them. That was an alert for me. When all of a sudden I saw the wooden crates opened up in Georgetown and I realized there was large weapons in there, the red flag came on for me too. I said, oh my God, they could have gotten me arrested here in this foreign country. Suddenly when I was told to turn over my passport because they would keep it for me that was a heightened alert. And then when they finally asked me if I had any money on me, and I told them no, but I did have some US dollars on uh -oh. me, that again was a red alert. And immediately I said, I think we've made a big mistake. But I could not tell my husband that because we didn't know who could trust who. He had created that type of environment that even if you were married to someone, you didn't know if you could tell them what your true feelings were. Mm -hmm. So immediately, I had to start trying to formulate a plan. And ultimately, after a couple of months, an opportunity arose for me to actually get a letter smuggled to my mother in Florida. And she came with what I told her was needed, which was cash and to keep her passport. And we then made a plan that we were going to him as a group because I had been communicating unbeknownst to him, the prophet who was supposed to know everything. I had been communicating through a lovely Guyanese family allowing me to use their cell, their phone. I was able to contact the United States Collect. So every time when Jim Jones would have a meeting with those of us who were in the Planning Commission, he kept saying, how do they know what we're doing? I can't figure out what's going on. And all along, I was the one that was giving the information back to the United amazing, States. Amazing, amazing. I have another question. No, please do, please do, please do. Associated Press and the San Francisco Chronicle took photos and interviewed Jim Jones, but there are a few photos of, of Jones. Did he dislike the media and avoided them before the New West Magazine article in summer of 1977? And with that, I wanted to add my question related to that, and it is, would you agree that the move to Jonestown between 74 and 77 was as much ideological 
as it was a response to the New West Magazine article. Was the move to Jonestown from 74, before the magazine hits in 77, because I think Russell, you almost answered the question already the way you, you know, sort of contextualize the larger, you know, socialistic dynamic here. Um, so I guess that partly answers that, yes, it was an ideological move, but I think sometimes people only see it as Jones panicked and fled. And I'm like, wait a minute, no, there was, this was ideological too. And the reason this was important to me is because writing a book on black nationalism, I'm looking at the history of black nationalists and I'm realizing my thesis in the book ended up being all they do is talk about leaving and they're not serious about leaving. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who had far more resources than Jim Jones since the 1930s, never even took it seriously and never left. Malcolm never left. All these talkers about black nationalism, Garvey, going back to Africa, the one person that did it was Jim Jones. Well, I'm, t I'm talking about in terms of, let me, let me clarify. I'm talking about in terms of the ideological um, sort of, you know, advocacy of it within the context of American politics and the sort of ideological tug between, say, Garveyism and NACP, Malcolm and King, and that tendency, even Farrakhan and Jesse Jackson of late. Um, and so the idea that you would sort of um, uh, understand that this is an integrationist movement carrying out what these separationists have been you know, advocating for, for decades. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't call it an a integrationist. Well, I, I think we should, we should probably get the, Language? Get, the, get the audience involved, but, 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 but let me just make a quick point, which is to say, I wouldn't call it an integrationist, and I, I don't, you know, I'd love to hear Lieutenant Williams' response. I wouldn't call it an integrationist movement, particularly because we're in a moment where among liberals, this notion of sort of diversity um, is the epitome of, of racial justice. So that, uh, you know, liberals, uh, I think particularly white liberals, think that, you know, uh, the presence of different kinds of people um, equals racial justice. And I think that's a real um, distortion of the anti-racist project. I mean, one of the remarkable things about, you know, Lieutenant Williams was talking about um, the church as an anti-racist institution. That's not just to say there was black folks and white folks and some other kinds of folks. That's not anti-racism, that's diversity, right? You got diversity here in San Francisco, but you ain't got no racial justice, mm -hmm. right? Am I right? I mean, half the black folks I passed on the way here were, were homeless, right. and I ain't passed that many black folks, right? right? So what the hell is happening? I mean, Lieutenant Williams was talking about this going no, way back I to say the that every, I say that every day. Right, I'm like, damn. Right. Where's, so you know. I mean, so it was, it, was an anti, it was a purposeful struggle against white supremacy. It's very powerful when white folks do that because hardly any American white folks do that. You know, you got two kinds of, most, for the most part, you got, you know, two kinds of white Americans. You have a small minority that's overtly uh, racist. Well, let's say three. There's a small minority that's overtly racist. Well, I have a, I have a Trump question coming next, but go ahead. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a portion, a large portion, that outwardly disavows racism, but then, you know, in fact, guards their, their white privilege. And then there's a tiny, tiny, tiny minority, almost, you know, insignificant, that actively struggles against white supremacy for their entire lives. And I think within people's temple, that they were some of those white folks, you know? Um, and, and the other, other quick thing I'll say, and then I'll shut up and, and the audience should, should, should jump in. I'm gonna have to respectfully disagree with, with, right. with Lieutenant Williams when you talked about um, capitalism. I don't think that what you found, what People's Temple found when they went to Guyana was socialism. I think that when you encountered poverty, uh, when you encountered marginalization, when you encountered uh, sickness when you encountered all of that privation, that was capitalism that you encountered, right? I mean, that's, cap that's what capitalism looks like. Right. Why is the West rich, right? Because it plundered the rest of the world. Right. That's how we built all of this wealth, right? right? So the, 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 the point was that, you know, um, that's not what socialism looks like. The promise of socialism was the promise of building a just society on the ashes of slavery and on the ashes of colonialism and on the ashes of imperialism. That's why Guyana was, was poor in 1975, 1976, 1978, and that's why Guyana is poor now, because the, the, the capitalist West 
is so rich because it plundered Guyana and it mm -hmm. plundered the rest of the world, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. so, I mean, it's really important to understand that, that sort of engaged politics, that politics of building a new reality, particularly because we're in a moment today where despite you know, the election, despite our commander in chief, there are a great many Americans, particularly young Americans, who are beginning to ask these same questions. Mm -hmm. You know, that there has to be a better future than this. There has to be a better reality. In fact, they're asking it in some ways even more urgently because the stakes are so much higher. You know, we're looking at the, the end of the human species, mm -hmm. right? So I, I, I would just make that mm -hmm. in and, and so again, you know, we're sort of trying to get at this question, although whether or not this was ideological or, or whether this is just a panic on the part of Jim Jones. And, and one question from the floor is, why didn't he stay here in San Francisco and fight since he had all these politicians in his pocket? Carlton Goodlett said, don't leave, stay, fight. Jim Jones was not a dumb man. I mean, now he knows and he knew then and he knew all along. Once he was facing the charges that were being lodged against him, the San Francisco Police Department had investigations on him. The FBI had investigations on him. Investigations were being launched all over the place. He knew if he came back here, he was going to be arrested as soon as he stepped on U.S. soil. So he was not going to put himself in that situation. As far as the missionary project in Guyana. It was never meant for everybody to go over there and the mass numbers that had occurred. It was a panic when he was in a drug-induced state and he felt these were his people and he wanted them all right there at his throne. And at that time, didn't the, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but at that time, weren't the Moonies in, uh, invaded by the FBI or something? The right around Moonies that time? were around and they were having a problem. Um, at that time, the Islam, the nation was having a problem. You had Angela Davis having a problem. The Black Panthers were having a problem. All of these things were compounding and he was telling us that this whole country is against you. As black Americans, we're trying to protect you. We don't want you to be abused by this government. Let's go to this country, this Guyanese country, this third world country, where you will be respected, you will be protected. So I, I think, again, politics played an important role, but again, the building of Guyana was something, the, I shouldn't say Guyana, the building of, of Jonestown in Guyana was something that was going to take time and things were moving at a slower pace initially. And I think if he would have had his way, the numbers would have come over, the number of people would have come over slow, slower. By doing so, it would have perhaps even allowed others to make the decision not to go based upon limited communications and things like that. But again, because of the investigations being lodged at such a record number here in the United States, he realized that the attorneys that he had in Guyana with him were not really capable of providing him with what he was going to need to fight this. And even though he had all of that money and everything, the money was not going to buy him out of now, this. That's interesting, because Father Divine is one of the influences on Jim Jones, and one Absolutely. of the things that confirms his divinity was that when he was tried in Sayville, Long Island for disturbing the peace with 50 other blacks who moved into an all-white town in 1909 or so, um, and the Klan had burned a cross, and Father Divine's people were protected. Um, and um, they all worked as sort of domestics in the white community of Sayville. That's why they were tolerated, but the Klan had burned a cross in downtown, and because they were not harmed, Father Divine was seen as a god, a protector of his people. And what I'm trying to get to, some of you might know the famous story of Father Divine, where a judge had incarcerated him excessively for this disturbance, and it was unnecessary after eight years of complete peace of getting along with the community, and then Father Divine's people said, if you put him in jail, you're going to die. The judge put Father Divine in jail. A middle-aged man, with, as far as we know, had perfect health, falls dead with Father Divine in jail 
Father Divine goes to jail at a Suffolk County Police Department, uh, a, 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 a Suffolk County jail, and Father Divine, if you read this, converts the whole jail to his movement. So, if, so my point is, Father Divine, one of the markers of his divinity was that uh, the judge died when he punished him. And I'm just thinking, for Jones, what an opportunity would have been to confirm his divinity, which was to zap the judge who sentenced him like Father Divine did. But somehow, it led to just the opposite reaction. It's interesting that you bring up Father Divine. Father Divine was what changed the whole dynamics of People's Temple. I wish we never would have went to Philadelphia and hooked up with the Father Divine movement because Mother Divine was there and we were at one of their services and suddenly they started calling Mother Divine Mother and they referred to Father Divine as Father. The next thing we knew when we came off of that trip from Philadelphia, we were told my new name now is Father and you will address me as Father and my wife Marceline will be known as Mother. And he also stole Many of the members of the Father's Divine Movement got on our buses yeah, with us yeah. and joined People's Temple. But, but even agricultural project, if you look up Father Divine's history, he had his own agricultural project in, uh, in, in New York and his uh, at a place called Crum, uh, Crum Elbow. And FDR's first cousin and he had a fight over the naming of this land called uh, Crum Elbow. And because of the fight over the name, FDR's cousin sells the property to Father Divine, and so Father Divine's next door neighbor is the President of the United States. Father Divine was so bad. I mean, Jim Jones wanted to be this man because he was four foot 11, the baddest black man that ever lived on this earth, in my opinion. Ever since I've read, I've been writing this book, and everybody's like, why are you taking this? It's depressing writing this book at times. It destroys my soul sometimes. But when I read about Father Divine, I just get so happy. And my family got so happy. And I'm sitting around at places talking to people about Father Divine, and nobody even knows who he is, and I don't follow him. But his economic program was based on Booker Washington. The only person Father Divine had on his wall at home in his offices was the picture of Booker Washington. And from Booker Washington, of course, you get Garvey, you get Father Divine, you get a whole uh, aspiration of Martin Luther King to be the next kind of black leader that Booker was. So to sleep on Booker Washington is to sleep on the whole notion of black leadership, because he becomes the inspiration for all of these people, including Father Divine. And then Jim Jones sort of picks up as he encounters Father Divine, and it transforms the movement. But I wonder if you would agree that the rank and file members of the movement did not realize the influence of Father Divine. Did the rank and file members realize the influence of Father Divine beyond going to the trips? Initially, we did not. We, I mean, when he said we were going to the Father Divine uh, Missionary, we just said, oh, okay. But then all of a sudden we saw this uh, white female come out and we saw these people calling her mother. And I'm like, what are they calling this woman mother for? And, but we realized how loyal they were to her. And then that's what also he started to make us feel guilty. Do you see how loyal they are to Mother Divine? Don't I protect you? Don't I provide for you? Haven't I given you everything that you need? We eat together. No one goes hungry. We have a drug rehabilitation program. I have adopted a black son. I have shown you a way of life, the way you should be living. Don't you think I deserve the same respect and admiration that they're giving to this woman? He shamed us and humiliated us and make us say, yes, you do. And so now we're going to refer to you that way. We're going to be humble. And when he brought their members of that missionary project into People's Temple, that is when major changes started to occur. And songs that we used to sing about social justice and freedom, like come and sing a simple song of freedom, or walk a mile in my shoes, suddenly changed to songs like, Father Divine, what a wonderful savior. Oh, oh, glory, hallelujah. And then the next thing it went to, 
Father Jim Jones, what a wonderful Savior. And so then it became all about him and everybody trying to compete for his attention and for his one moment of him visually giving you the light and light in the church. Interesting. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Thank you, Mommy. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. You know, so a lot, Father Divine. So I'm, I'm so excited about, about the, the Father Divine project. There's so much that could be said about Father Divine. I think Father Divine, like Marcus Garvey, mm -hmm. I think like a lot of these sort of black nationalists, pan-Africanists, um, or even, you know, leftist uh, movements has been deeply misunderstood, has been distorted, mm -hmm. has been caricatured. Um, and, you know, there's no question that, you know, some of these figures did quite well for themselves and amassed a great deal of, of power. And, and um, so there's always elements, I think, of, of exploitation. But if you, if you look at the reality of people's lives, right, you know, I think as a historian, what I try and do is I never um, approach a project from the premise that people are fundamentally stupid mm -hmm. or that people are fundamentally uh, gullible. Mm -hmm. um, that there's, all, we always really have to understand what is it that draws people to an alternative politics, right? Or to a sort of heterodox um, religious faith or, or practice. If you look at Father D Divine, one of the most powerful aspects of that movement, again, was the anti-racism. Yeah. You know, in the midst of Jim Crow America, yeah. you know, in the midst of the Klan, in the midst of, of, of sort of racial terrorism, you had a, a group of people looked on by a vast majority of Americans as total kooks who were saying that actually we can organize our lives in a different way. That, that the sort of racial logic that pervades this society um, that we can reject it all together and that we can embody of, of a radical alternative. You know, and that I think is, is transformative and deeply inspiring for you know, a set of Americans, black, white, and, and et cetera, who, who, who never could have imagined that, that, that possibility. The other part of it is that is the communalism. Yes. Right? Yes. So I mean, you know, black folks, who, and you know, these are working class, the fact that a lot of these movements are working class black, Garveyism is a working class black movement. Um, a lot of the, the black folks in, in, in People's Temple are poor or working class, you know. Um, I think that makes it easier quite, quite often um, for the sort of master narratives to dismiss them, okay. you know, as, uh, as, as, as dupes, as gullible, as naive. Part of what Father Divine was doing, part of what even the Communist Party was doing, apart from their anti-racism, was providing a kind of alternative social yeah. infrastructure that the American state did yeah. not, yeah. right? So, I mean, why were, why were people uh, poor? Yeah. You know, because there were no jobs, yeah. right? Because, there, were no, because there, was no, there was no social safety net, because it had been, you know, shredded, you know? So, um, the, 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 that idea of building a society beyond not only racism, but also beyond want, beyond but, poverty. But I would the idea that both racism and poverty is manufactured is a choice that a society yeah. makes, and we can make alternative right. choices. No, and I would just add to that, the, the, that, the, that the consciousness was also altern, uh, changed through the names, for example, of, of Father Dunga and his followers. Each person took on any name they wanted any name you can self-identify. And of course, we see that with the Nation of Islam, right, with, with the X factor. But Father Divine, the reason why I say I get so happy is with Father Divine, for example, they wouldn't even let you say hello because it included the word hell first. Yeah. So whenever you greeted each other, you said peace. Mm -hmm. That's how the peace mission movement people only greeted each other, peace. And my mother, who's now gone, um, when she was taking care of a, a white family in Long Island, where I'm from, the Lunefs, a, 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 a Jewish family, um, she told me that Mr. Lunef followed Father Divine. I'm like, you mean that white man follows that black? And, and I was about 50. I'm like, are you, are you kidding me? Like, the Lunefs are rich. We're in the projects. And you telling me that white man with that money follows a little black man? And my mother said yes. And that's when I got hooked on to Father Divine and found my way to People's Temple. Thanks. My mother is the reason why I'm interested in the People's Temple. And you're right about the name changes because I know that we brought grace love. I'll never forget grace love. And grace love 
He, 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 he started telling us, look at these beautiful names. And then suddenly we started to see people's temple members start to change their names, take on all these different types of names. But also that's where, after being there, we started with communal living. And because at first people were not living communally in people's temple either. Mm -hmm. But again, it was those types of dynamics that started to change a lot. So we're out of time almost. So let me get to these questions that people want to be asked. And there's about three related to uh, this question. So I'll link, link them all together. Um, how might people's temple be relevant to the current social, political, and economic circumstances of the US? That is, to young people, seniors, those without homes, race relations, Black Lives Matter, Colin Kaepernick and the Oscar Grant movement, which all happened right here in Oakland and San Francisco, and national politics. One day after the election, People's Temple researcher Archie Smith Jr. recently provided a preliminary analysis of the People's Temple movement, Jim Jones and his relationship to his followers, and Demise, and Donald Trump. Social media has a Trump-Jones-fused picture. I don't know if any of you have seen it yet. With, it's Donald Trump with Jim Jones's glasses, white suit. Nobody, who has seen it? Has anyone seen it? Oh, I'm, I think I'm on Facebook too much. <laughs> but there it exists. There's a picture of Donald Trump. It's Donald Trump angry with Jim Jones's glasses transposed onto him and the white suit and the black uh, uh, shirt. So, um, and even today, I heard people talking today about the, the Trump Kool-Aid. So Archie Smith, and three questions from the floor I want to know is, is Donald Trump a cult leader? There's, there's two questions there kind of like that are resonating with me. First of all, I think if People's Temple was in existence today, it would be very relevant. Because all of the things that are going on, the current affairs, everything else, that People's Temple was very up to date and involved in all of that. So the political part, we would have played a major portion in it if it was in existence today. All right. Um, as far as Donald Trump, uh, <laughs> you're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> uh, you know, the United States is built on cultism, mm -hmm. if you really think mm -hmm. about it. When you have a hierarchy, there's always a leader, and everybody glamorizes and listens to the leader, and we all learn how to be good followers. But how many of us are ever really challenged to learn how to be leaders? That's what's so important. That's the missing link. That was one of the major missing links for many of us. We learned how to be good followers, but we forgot about the fact that following can lead you over the cliff if you follow the leader too closely. So, my response to Donald Trump is that there are those who have allowed him to become a leader for them. And as sinister as he is, yeah, it could kind of be kind of culty like. So my response is going to be yes, depending upon if you allow him mm -hmm. to lead you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this goes back to your previous question about the transformation of People's Temple encountering the peace mission movement with Father Divine. How did the black membership of People's Temple who joined the Christians, uh, joined as Christians, deal with Jim Jones's growing atheistic views and blasphemous speech, speeches injected into his sermons? How did the religious black community accept his increasing you would have to ask that to a PK's kid, huh? Mm. That's preacher's kid. <laughs> okay, I know you're probably wondering why would my father stay there? My 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 dad. I shouldn't say father because I don't want you to think I'm talking about Jim Jones. So why would my dad stay there? Again, you have to realize that my dad was still a God-fearing minister. He said his prayers in the morning. He said his prayers at night, despite the fact he was told he didn't need to pray anymore, and he still read his Bible. The reason that we would stay is because as God-fearing people, one thing you have to understand is black people are very loyal to someone when someone does something good to them, good for them. And 
Again, we thought that he had literally healed my dad of the heart condition. So I made a pact within myself that I was never going to leave People's Temple, and I owed my life, my services to Jim Jones and People's Temple for the fact that he was able to help my family stay, sustain what we had already had. I think by far and large, Many of the black Americans stayed with him for that reason, and then others found themselves in situations where they had not maintained their relationships with their biological families because they had bought into the policy that he had that we were not supposed to intermingle with outsiders. And if your family wasn't a member of People's Temple, they were outsiders. So many of them had destroyed their relationships with their families. So they were dependent and isolated, dependent upon Jim Jones for their all in all and their everything. Thank you. Dr. Hopkinson, I have a quick question for you. And it's here on this card from the floor. It says, wasn't Jonestown, in essence, another white supremacist genocide? <laughs> or it's asking, was it? Was it genocide? Was it racial genocide? Which goes back to my first question of how we all think about, how do you define or understand the movement and what happened? Like, how do we conceptualize it? Yeah, I definitely think you can make an argument for that. Um, you know, the, the other thing was the way that it sort of played out locally. Um, you know, I have a part in my book where uh, Walter Rodney is, you know, so this is one of, so Burnham is, basically a dictator, right? So he's, he's rigged elections um, since independence to maintain power um, over the country. And uh, one of his challengers was a historian, Walter Rodney, who had a, um, he had another party that was sort of, it was a multiracial party that was sort of challenging him. And, um, and so he had a lot of speeches where he talked about you know, this is, he called him, he's, he said that he has like the Midas touch, but it's like the reverse Midas touch. Everything he touches turns to shit. That's Donald what, Trump. Yeah, Go ahead. This, this is what he talked about with Burnham. Um, and then, you know, he joked about how people, you know, Guyana, people don't know. It's, it's a small country in South America, a little bit, you know, the only English speaking uh, country on, on the continent. And um, often mistaken with Ghana. And so he would joke that, you know, now when people say, hey, wait, Jim jo uh, Jonestown, isn't that where you're from? He's like, no, 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 I'm from Ghana. You, you, you get it wrong, it's Ghana. You know, it's not Guyana. Um, so I think there was, you know, I think locally, I, uh, Russell sort of alluded to this with the teeth sucking part. I mean, people were just sort of like, a little bit divorced, um, you know, sort of uh, distanced from it. I mean, the things that go on in the interior um, is, is very much, um, separated and distance from what goes on um, on the coast and in, in the city anyway. And so I think there was a, a bit of sort of ironic distance. Okay, this is something that happened to those people, those Americans. And of course, it's a, cha uh, you know, it's a tragedy, but it, it wasn't something that was ingrained into, like it wasn't a Guyanese project mm -hmm. exactly. So uh, people were sort of a little bit uh, distanced from it. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, you could look at it that way. Um, you know, it definitely... You know, this sort of white Jesus sort of figure, the prophet that everybody's sort of following. Um, yeah. uh, you know, I think that definitely probably played a role in him being able to get away with what he got away with mm -hmm. for so long. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, you know, you and I have spoken about this. And when I came back, I come to the conclusion that there was a great possibility that People's Temple could have been a government experiment on brainwashing to see how far people might allow someone to go. And, and I'm not going to say I've given up potentially on that as a theory. I have multiple theories. But one thing I can say that I've always believed, and I will believe until I go to my grave, that this was pure racial genocide. It was ordered by Jim Jones, and there's, you know, and of course those who were in leadership with him, and um, 
that's just the bottom line. I'm not going to ever believe that people just walked up there and willingly said, I'm going to take this poison or I'm going to drink this Kool-Aid. Um, I was around these people for my entire life, practically, you know. I mean, you, you're around people for 10 to 11 years. You know what they're pretty much capable of. So, so and this is for any of you, but, but I'm really in, curious in your response and, and Russell's in particular, are we going from race um, revolutionary suicide to race murder? Was, in other words, is revolutionary suicide, as Jim Jones interpreted, race murder? That's, that's what we're talking about, genocide. And the theory behind the activity was revolutionary suicide. It was a, a, a concept. But it really wasn't revolutionary suicide. As I see that, that was like a coward act on his part. It was a cowardly act. He called it revolutionary suicide to begin to get some of the people to stand up to try and prove that they were going to be good comrades and, oh, yes, I will come up and, and drink of this drink because this had been a practice that had been going on. And so many people just thought it would have been another hoax. So, again, I'm not going to buy into the fact that everybody stood up and said, yes, we're going to commit revolutionary suicide. Because remember, the end of the tape, there are people questioning, why should they do this? Don't we have other And you had a question about Christine Miller, Miller so if you could address exactly. Christine Miller, Christine uh, somebody Miller's wants to hear about question. Christine Miller as to why do we have to do this now? And if we're going to do it, why do we have to also take the baby's lives? They're children. No one's going to hold them accountable for what has happened It says, can you, can you speak about Christine Miller's final plea to save Jonestown on November 18th? I believe her plea for mercy was a plea that every one of them would have wanted to have stated but they were afraid because remember, there were armed guards all around that encampment. And if you got out of line, you knew what was going to happen to you. And after they've killed a congressman, do you really think that your life is more valuable than the congressman? So at that point, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a very tumultuous situation where you have 900 people trying to figure out what can they do, where can they go, and they've been told how dangerous it is if you go out into that jungle area. I'm gonna tell you something, I walked around there a lot, but I never went <laughs> past that little wood structure you see there, cause I'm from the city. I don't wanna even see a snake, let alone a lizard. So I knew I wasn't going out in there. Too, Wait, that's what I'm trying to tell you. I saw that at the house at Lamaha Gardens. I saw a little Guyanese lady fishing. And I said, what is she doing out there? And they said, oh, she's fishing. So I'm looking, and the next thing I know, she gets up and she starts running. I said, where that little lady running to? She doesn't even have any fish. And then I went out there and looked, and I said, oh, oh I'm, I'm out of here. I'm telling you, some serious, serious creatures that you've never seen yeah, before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Uh, this, this is more of a statement um, than a question. It says, the People's Temple was uh, important to the Burnham government, um, and it uh, represented a large community of people living in the bush, quote unquote, planting vegetables, et cetera, something that most uh, coastal Guyanese did not want to do. Government gave PT a one-time radio program on Saturdays to talk about their successful agricultural project. It was a form of propaganda for the Guyanese. And yet, it, Jones didn't have the appeal down in Guyana. Why? why? Why didn't he have the appeal in Guyana that he had in Bayview or, or Fillmore? He had the appeal with the Amur Indians that were living in the jungle because they would come in and eat and partake in everything with us. But he never really had an interest really in being in Georgetown and, and networking with those groups of folks. He wanted to stay isolated in his area so that he could be in charge. Because remember now, Forbes Burnham was not coming to Jonestown to, to tell him what were going to be the rules and the guidelines and the regulations there. He was the sheriff, the mayor, the president, everything. He was the all in all. 
So he doesn't want to involve the actual Guyanese citizens from Georgetown in the Jonestown project because that would have spent the card a different way to the point where Mary, maybe Burnham would have told him, you got to leave and you got to leave today. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't have that happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's also, it's, it's very remote. So uh, a few years ago, my, a lot of my family that's still in Guyana, they, um, they're gold miners. And so I had one uncle who took me into Port Kaituma, which is not, not far. yes, I did. And we went on, you know, ATV, we're like it's hanging on the, yeah. I know, it's <laughs> It really is, and they have the Jonestown sign, you know, where you, oh yeah, I, I, actually I meant to bring the picture because this was just for a few years ago. I can, I can send it to you. Um, but it's very remote. So to get to Port Kaituma, which is not too far from Jonestown, we, uh, so going there, I took a plane. It was like a little six-seater plane and, you know, very low. And you look down at all you, see, it really is rainforest. All you see is green. Um, and then coming back to uh, Georgetown, we took the, we took the boat and it was like 10, I mean, it was 10 hours. Like we started early in the morning and that's, and, and Joe, I think it was called. Yeah. So, and, and you know, and you're going through, um, you know, on a little speed boat and, um, and there's a lot of Amerindian villages where you would stop. And so this is like, like this was recently. So it's very, it's not accessible at all. No, no, nothing's, wow. nothing's changed. So, so I think we've come to the final question of the night, and I, and I want to end it with, with you, Professor Rickford, and uh, that is a, it's a little bit convoluted, so bear with me, but I'm trying to understand if it's possible, in, in your imagination as a historian, um, knowing how history changes or time changes definitional meanings or, or understanding of things, can you imagine a situation where people have a different understanding of Jonestown than what they had in 1978-79. Is, is there some way, I, I almost want to pull on the biblical notion of can anything good come out of Jerusalem and say can anything good be said about people's temple for the future when people open the book, they take away the positive of it. Is that possible or is it, is, is it just too overwhelming what happened? I, I, I think it depends on the power of our uh, of our political and social imagination. You know, I, I think that it, it remains easy to dismiss um, these radical political alternatives, these experiments, particularly those that go horribly, horribly wrong, um, as fever dreams, as inherently uh, corrupt or bankrupt from the beginning, and I think that if we do that, we, we obscure and we distort um, the promise of utopianism. I mean, oftentimes we, we speak of utopianism in sort of dismissive um, ways, but you know, you would have to be, if you were living in a, um, in a place called the United States um, in the current moment, you would have to be utopian to imagine the United States as a just society, you know, today. I have a dream. Right? You would have to, in, so in other words, think about utopianism as a kind of vision that transcends all of the ugly realities around you. You know, very briefly, you talked about revolutionary suicide, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, sort of Huey New Newton's of the Black Panthers, Huey Newton's, you know, sort of radical concept of, of revolutionary suicide. Well, the truth is that Jim Jones was a master of appropriating Yes. Right? Yes. Ideas. Yes. He, his, his sort of philosophy was a kind of eclectic um, combination of all of these various strands. So, and, 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 you know, as Lieutenant Williams already suggested, the People's Temple was connected to everybody. Right? From uh, who was President Carter's Carter. Carter. The guy who was governor then is uh, governor now. You know, Willie Mayor Brown, Brown, Cecil Williams, um, the, you know, Mayor Moscone. Um, uh, you know, uh, Harvey Milk, um, Angela Davis, yes. Yes, that's true. the Nation of Islam, yes, right. the American Indian Movement, yes. the Fraternal yes. Order of Police. Yes. You know, I was, in, I was in Berkeley earlier today looking at Eldridge Cleaver papers. Mm -hmm. um, Jim Jones gave a press conference in 1976 to defend uh, Eldridge Cleaver, who had returned from exile to face his prison sentence. 
And Jim Jones was saying, presumably to a radical and progressive audience, it doesn't matter that Eldridge has now gone to the right and embraced capitalism, he still is a black man and he's oppressed and we should stand up for it. Right? So I mean, we have to understand, um, Jim Jones was drawing on these, I believe, deeply legitimate yearnings for some kind of, of political alternative. Um, um, and I think that, that he, he was successful because people were so desperate for an alternative. And, if I just, and this is the last thing I'll say, getting back to Trump very briefly. <laughs> because I think this is, this is relevant. You know, it's very easy, especially in a place like San Francisco, to get up in front of an audience and, and, and beat up on Trump, right? I'm not at all gonna defend Trump. What I'm saying is that Trump is, is, is a symptom, right? <laughs> that we created Trump, right? That people get the leaders that they deserve. We created Trump. We created Trump with our racism. And we created Trump with our misogyny. And we created Trump with our endless war. Right? And as long as we continue to operate, so, you know, Martin Luther King said back in 67, if you keep this up, the society is going to die spiritually. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and Trump is what we've bred. He is, he is what we've created um, with our spiritual death. So, you know, yes, he's a, he, he's a cult leader in the sense that the United States is a cult of white supremacy, that it's, that it's a cult of capitalism and, and materialism um, and, and individualism, right? That it's a cult of, of war making, right? There's certainly like that, that, that he's, a, he's, he's a cult leader. And then we, you know, we tend to lament, I think, the fact that people who are deeply alienated in the United States at various historical moments have looked overseas for, for freedom, for alternative models. Right, for alternative social and political models. I'm glad <laughs> that they, not only that they've looked overseas, that they've looked beyond um, the parameters of this kind of society, but I'm glad that they're alienated. And I want more people to be alienated. I mean, isn't that King what, he's, what, what King said? That you're supposed to be maladjusted, right? So I mean, the idea that people are maladjusted and then they become manipulated, right? I mean, the, 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 the crime is in the manipulation, but the crime is not in yearning for, for some kind of, of alternative, a, a vision, that, that, that vision, that yearning for a radical alternative, I think is very much um, um, still alive. And, and I think that, you know, look, there, there's, a, there's a populist fascism or proto-fascism that, that is a foot that has been unleashed in our society. But I think if we look closely, if we look in the crevices, they're also the inkling of, um, of, a, of a far more humane vision, right? Um, I, I see elements of it in Black Lives Matter, uh, in the fight for 15, um, you know, in various, uh, it, to some extent in, in, in the Me Too movement, um, that there are radical alternatives. And I think that, that we as people of conscience, right, I think that our job, our responsibility um, is to join and enlarge and, and amplify these movements so that ultimately we can do battle with the kind of fascism, the kind of degeneration, you know, politically, socially, and spiritually um, that, we, that we face. Thank you. Dr. Hopkinson, do you have, one, have a final word? And then and we'll wrap up with, with you with a final word. Yeah, very well said, uh, Russell. And, you know, I think this is what I sort of opened with. I mean, I get it. You know, and I, I talk to even, so my, you know, I have family in the bush still, and I, I look at the news and I say, I might need your help, you know, <laughs> I, I, might, I, might, I might need an escape, right, I, I might need an escape, and, you know, it's just this idea, like, I've recently, I've done work in, in Guyana, and I've done research in Jamaica, and I also was doing some research in London, and among people on, in the diaspora, and it's just this feeling that we just, we can't get any rest, you know, no matter where you go, you know, in, in London, they're they're trying to expel the people from the Windrush generation. And, you know, here, uh, you know, you could be killed and nobody is, you know, the state could kill you. And there's no consequence for that. Um, you know, everywhere you go, like there's it's like it, it feels like, um, you know, something sort of seizing around you, you know, spiritually um, yeah. and in this country. And so I, I 
totally understand um, why people would get on a plane and try to escape and try to think about something, uh, a better way to live. I mean, drugs are horrible uh, thing. Narcissism is deadly. Um, and so, you know, it did end up going wrong, but, you know, I hope that, um, you know, as, as Russell said, that we, we keep dreaming and we keep thinking and we keep, um, you know, having a vision for a better world. Thank you. Thank you. Lieutenant Williams, last word. Well, again, I have to agree with um, everything that has been said by both of you. And ironically, I shared something with Professor Taylor that I recently learned. The association that I was a president of and now I'm the president of their youth program, the Officers for Justice, which is uh, San Francisco police officers. Back in 1977, um, wrote a letter of, I, I'm sorry, not 77, 74, wrote a letter of introduction and recommendation to the Guyanese government that they allow People's Temple to purchase that land to use it for one dollar. So needless to say, I looked at my um, fellow brothers and sisters in OFJ and I said, gee, thank you very much. He got over on you too. No wonder you guys decided to accept me. And I said, but again, the prime typical example that it cuts across the grade. And just like he was able to lure law enforcement agencies, um, this type of lure continues to transcend everywhere. And I think we have an ultimate responsibility to recognize the characteristics of cultism, recognize the warning signs and the manipulative techniques that are utilized. And if nothing else, I feel that my life was restored and I was given a second opportunity at life to sit in front of you today to try and warn you of the danger and the rise of cults. And again, those of you, if you're thinking about Scientology, Think about it again. Think about Thank you. it again. <laughs> Thank you. So I just had to give you that. Thank you so much. Let's give them all a round of applause. So, so they'll be around for you to talk to them. Uh, uh, um, both uh, Dr. Hopkinson and Dr. Rickford will be signing their books over in the corner so you can see them there. Uh, I was asked uh, to give an announcement that I will be speaking this Sunday at 9.30 at the First Universal uh, Church uh, on Franklin and Geary at 9.30 of, in recognition of the 40th anniversary of People's Temple. And then we, I made a mistake and left my car without bringing the fly, hard copy flyers, but we have organized the city's first ever recognition and public event, as far as I know, um, of the People's Temple Movement by the city of San Francisco itself. For, for the first six months after Jonestown happened, the people in Oakland and the people of survivors who finally came around have been meeting since 1979, six months after. Every year for, since 1979, Oakland has been bringing people together and San Francisco has done nothing. And so spontaneously, I was asked by the Chronicle about these, with all these monuments coming down throughout the country, they took down the early days monument here, and Kai Milner from the Chronicle wrote an article about the monuments and coming up and going down, and she decided to write an article about sites in San Francisco that warrant need some kind of recognition. And so she said, she looked at the, um, the International Hotel with the Filipino community and their struggle, and then she said People's Temple, Jonestown, and the survivors. And so my comments in the article was that the pressure needed to be put on London Breed and the city, especially given that she's from the Fillmore, pressure needed to be put on them to come full circle with this history and the, the city owed it uh, to come full circle with it. And so just serendipitously, we were all brought together without a plan. We, these young black people from the Fillmore said they wanted to do something. They saw my comments, they reached me. She and I had already been working together on LAPD, uh, SFPD things to get together. And so all of this came together 
where on November 18th of this year, for the first time ever in the city of San Francisco, we're going to have a public observation, a memorial, an actual walk or march, if you want to call it that, but I, I like to call it a walk, from 1859 Geary Boulevard at 1.45 p.m. on the anniversary of the event. Then we're going to have a brief press conference and walk all the way down Fillmore with a police escort. The Parks and Recreation have given about $300,000. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that amount, but about $300,000 has been given for a monument to the survivors and memory of the people who died in Jonestown. Oh, that's right. And, and we'll, we will be on the 11th uh, at, on the Joe Marshall Show, Alive and Free. So we're trying our hardest. Because, see, a lot of people think about this as Jonestown only and about the tragedy. But like Russell has outlined here, for me, it's about the fact that the film one never really got to say what happened to it. London Breed was four years old. How many of those people do you think, how many of those children do you think London Breed knew or grew up with around at four years old? You think she didn't know anybody? or a lot of those children. That's how recent and real this is for me. And I was determined, and again, I have no personal connection to the movement, but for me, it was important that the black community of San Francisco have the final say or have some say about this. And that's what this is about. It's not about a bunch of former members coming together to do it over in San Francisco this time. It's the black community of Fillmore saying, we want to come full circle with what happened to us and we want people to know it happened to our community and not simply about religiousness, religiosity, and other you know, mystifications. And that, to me, was the important point with the out-migration of black San Francisco. This attempt to hold this space um, at the Fillmore Park is an attempt for the black community to say, we are still here, we're vibrant, and we're not going anywhere. We've always been small. We've always outperformed our numbers. Black San Francisco, historically, since the 1850s, has always outperformed its small numbers. And, been the, and we always read King leading the West Coast and everybody responding to King. That's nonsense. The truth is, the movement, a lot of it was grounded here in Garveyism in California in the West and moved that way, too. When you look at C.L. Dellums and Asa Philip Randolph and the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters as labor organizations in Oakland. Father Divine came to Oakland and took over a Garvey Unia movement church in Oakland and turned Garvey's church into Father Divine's church. Then Father Divine's people went to London and tried to convert Garvey to follow Father Divine. That's how vibrant this region is. And that's why it's so important that we... All of us, not just a, a few people from the community, but all of us need to come full circle. We want all of you out there on the 18th. We don't want to get out there with 10 people feeling miserable about this horrible thing and trying to do. There's no perfect way of doing this, but we just want to do something and say before everybody who's connected leaves that, that we know we can't do this right, but we're trying to do something. And we ask you to please come out on November 18th. If you can't make it at 1.45 or 2 o'clock and you don't want to be a part of the march, just come at 3, and that's when the program begins at 3 o'clock. I have 100 cards in my car, and because I was rushing, I'll have to give you the announcement rather than... In fact, while you all mingle, I'm going to run to my car and bring some back out here. How about that? Thank you all. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, California Historical Society. God bless all of you. Please feel free to talk to these individuals and also buy their books and sign their books. I'm James Taylor. Thank you all very much. Grace, we love you.